when we usually think about the hindrances. We think about the Buddhist comment that before you get the mind established in its frame of reference, before you establish mindfulness properly, before you can get into concentration, you've got to clear the hindrances out of the way. So we tend to think that the hindrances are mainly a problem with getting the mind into concentration. But they also hinder discernment. When you look at the Buddha's list of things that can go wrong as you're approaching death, the hindrances loom large as well. So when you're clearing them out of the way, it's not just a matter of arranging for a nice meditation tonight. You're trying to get some skill in clearing them out of the way that, so that when the body gets weaker and weaker and the end is near, these qualities don't take over the mind. This is at that moment that you're going to need your, all your powers of concentration and discernment. The big one the Buddha talks about, the one that comes first always is not to be worried. In other words, don't give in to restlessness and anxiety. He talks about different things you could be worried about. But two of them have to do with the two of the other hindrances. One is the fact that you're going to be leaving your sensual pleasures. As long as you're attached to thoughts of sensuality, you have that fear. You may go to some place where those pleasures no longer exist. Which is one of the reasons why, when the Buddha was giving Mahanama some instructions on how to counsel somebody who's dying, after making sure that the person was not worried about his family, worried about his work, or her family or her work, the next question was, are you worried about leaving behind human sensuality? And it's interesting, the Buddha doesn't recommend that you abandon thoughts of sensuality right away. He first has you tell the person who's about to die, hey, there is better sensuality up in heaven. Set your mind there. And then he would recommend you go up the, the ladder from one level to the next to the next. Because some of those lower heavens, they really, as I said, like the Gandharvas, they're really like the teenagers of the heavenly world. They're obsessed. So when you get to the higher levels of the sensual heavens, that people can seem to be a little bit more clear-headed. And as they get more clear-headed, then you can start talking about doing away with attachment to self-identity. So you can try the same technique with yourself here. Prepare yourself. Find yourself thinking about human sensuality. Tell yourself, hey, it's better up in the heavens and work your way up, and then realize that no matter how good it gets up there, you're going to have to come crashing down again. This is the contemplation of the graduated discourse, or the step-by-step -step discourse. You do good, you get rewarded, but then the rewards fall through. You don't think about getting out of this cycle entirely. And that's a perfectly legitimate thought to have as you're dying. Because the Buddha says there are cases where people gain awakening at the moment of death. Which is why taking rebirth as a working hypothesis is so important. Because a lot of people feel, well, when death comes there's nothing much you can do, so they just give up. From that point on, it's just like going down a slide. They don't give any thought to making good choices. Or that they're making choices at all, they just feel that events are taking over. You have to remind yourself, remind yourself you are making choices all the way. So even as the body is getting weaker, you want the mind to be strong. And one of the ways you strengthen it is to try to get it past its fascination with sensuality. Admitting that yes, it does have its good side, but it has its huge drawbacks. and keep those drawbacks firmly in mind. Another reason why you might be 
anxious is if you have doubts about the Dharma. Doubt and uncertainty, that's another hindrance. So here again, you remember, how do you overcome doubt? We look at what's skillful and unskillful in the mind. What are you doing right now that's skillful? Which thoughts coming through the mind are skillful? Hold on to those. As for the unskillful ones, don't let yourself wander off in that direction. So when you're working on getting past your doubts, you're working on one of the main reasons for worry and anxiety as death approaches. As for the two remaining hindrances, there's ill will. And the Buddha gives the example of the soldier. There was a soldier, a professional soldier, I came to see him one time and told him that his teachers had taught him, as they were teaching him all the skills he would need as a, a soldier, that if you die in battle, you're going to go to the heaven of the heroes. What does the Buddha have to say about that? And the Buddha, being the kind of person who didn't want to tell people that their occupation was wrong unless they were really serious about making an improvement, tried to avoid the question twice. But the soldier kept pressing him. So the Buddha finally said, if you're in the midst of battle, what mind state do you have? There's a lot of ill will. May these beings be destroyed. May these beings meet with a bad end. If you die with that mind state, you're going to go down. The soldier started to weep. And the boy said, that's why I didn't want to answer your question. The soldier said, it's, I'm not weeping over your answer. I'm just weeping over how much I've been deceived by my teachers. The point here being that you don't want to die with ill will. This is why the Buddha gave that recommendation when he said, if you're being pinned down and bandits are sawing off your limbs with a two-handled saw, you have to have good will for the bandits. You don't want to die with ill will for them. Because a death that's directed by ill will doesn't lead to anything good. It leads you to a situation where all you can think of is that you want revenge. That's not a good attitude with which to be reborn. And it's certainly not an attitude that's going to help you gain some clarity and see how you can get out of this mess entirely. And then the other hindrance is, is sloth and torpor. The Buddha went to see a group of monks in a sick ward one time. He says, our advice to you is approach death mindful and alert. In other words, the opposite of being slothful and torpid. Try to be clearly aware of one of the frames of reference, body, feelings, mind, mental qualities in and of themselves, and alert to what you're doing. Maintain your focus on the present moment, because that is the spot where you're going to be making your choices. And if you're just drifting off, drifting off, the choices are basically getting made for you in one of the more subconscious areas of the mind. And the subconscious tends to follow old habits. It's the part of the mind that doesn't really look at itself. That's why it's subconscious. And the way we try to get past that subconscious aspect is to learn to be quicker and quicker at seeing what we're doing, the choices we're making. As the Buddha said, even when you have an intention in the mind that you're not alert to, but the fact that it's there and it's influencing your choices, there's going to be a karmic repercussion. So the more you can reflect on your actions, the more likely you'll be able to check yourself. And you clean up a lot of areas of the mind that had been subconscious in the past, but now are brought into the light of day. So the basic message here is you want to face death unhindered. And the work that you do as you're meditating to get past the hindrances will have an impact that lasts much longer than just this meditation session. Remind yourself that you're developing skills. 
that you're going to need at all the important junctures in your life. The points where you're making decisions that will have a huge impact. And you want to make sure you're making those decisions with a mind state that's mindful, alert, motivated by goodwill. And coming from a clear sense of what the true Dharma has to teach, what the true Dharma is. That's one of the ways in which you can learn how to rely on yourself and be your own refuge. This is another way in which that principle is true. When the Buddha said that the Dharma protects those who practice it. Because it helps right at the spot where we most need it. We're making choices. And choices have an influence. So you want to be clear about what the best choices are. And you want to develop a mind state that can see that clearly. In action. <laughs>